Okay, now it's your turn. Um, before I... Uh, music. Um, first of all, the book coming apart, which, which part of the lecture is based on, is it will be available and Charles is going to sign them, correct? He asked that not everyone buy the book uh, because he doesn't think he can <laughs> last the night doing it, doing the signing. So it will be available outside at the end of proceedings. Uh, as we're running a little bit late because of a few complications at the start, what we're going to do now is serve dessert and coffee during discussion. We'll try and knock it off by 10 o'clock. So there are two microphones, please, one just there and one over there. So if you wish to ask a question, and Tim Wilson's already there, um, you may do so, please, but at, at the microphone. So uh, over to you, Tim, and then over to Charles. Thank you very much. <laughs> Apologies about that, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the address. It was excellent. My name's Tim Wilson. I wanted to ask, um, to me, so much of the power and influence that you've described, and I've read your book, uh, comes from people achieving preferential tax and regulatory arrangements, particularly for people in positions of big business or in big government. And to me, in many ways, they achieve that through a form of theft, and we have plenty of examples of that, uh, particularly financial gain uh, in Australia as well as the United States. So my question to you is, do you really think there can be honour amongst thieves to remove their top-down power that they have managed to take away from people and communities? Hmm. Well, let's start with the kinds of business that goes on when, when the government isn't involved. I mean, the, my impression is that among the business people that I know of and in talking to businessmen, that, that in many ways the business world is as honorable or more honorable than it has been in the past. That there is, a, there are a lot of people out there who, as I said during the presentation, want to do business with a handshake. They love people like that. They, 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 they are frustrated they can't. Now, suppose you can start, you start with a cultural shift in which it is okay to talk about those things publicly. Suppose that gets back in the air. Suppose that that business is sort of openly saying, this is what our ethics are, and this is the way we think it ought to be done, then you set up a countervailing force with regard to the kind of corruption that goes on, especially vis-a-vis -vis the government. It has to start with a lot of self-criticism. In the United States, for example, um, you may be familiar with earmarks, some of you who follow US politics which is just a center of corruption within uh, Congress because uh, Congress people can get inserted into a bill that has nothing to do with, with their little favor that they're going to do for their constituent. They can get a tax break. They can get a regulatory break. Those came under heavy criticism from the Tea Party and others. The Republican Party still didn't give them up, just the Democratic Party won't. Suppose that business added its voice Business which is beneficiary, uh, the beneficiary of a lot of that corruption and earmarks. Suppose you had them saying, we don't want this step anymore. We're tired of a minority of businesses who are trying to game the system. That changes the whole nature of the dialogue that's going on. Right now, the way things are, I'm sorry to carry this answer on, but it's a difficult question. The way things are right now, it's okay to sort of assume that businessmen are all corrupt and dishonest and venal and the only thing they care about is their profits. You've got to change that understanding of business before anything else can happen, and the people who must change that are business people themselves who both are proud of what they do and are openly critical and condemnatory of business people who do not behave that way. Peter Coleman. Uh, um, uh. Dr. Murray, uh, my name is Peter Coleman. Dr. Murray, uh, my question refers to your subtitle, um, Reaffirming uh, Old Truths, uh, and re also refers to the controversy you, you uh, appear to have caused a couple of weeks ago at the time of the American presidential election when you were reported as having voted in the Maryland uh, referendum uh, for in, in support of legalizing uh, uh, marriage equality or 
same in same Australia, vote. you know how I voted on the marriage amendment. That's incredible in Maryland. Well, uh, <laughs> only on the internet. <laughs> uh, and from the point of view of you as a libertarian, there's no mystery at all. Uh, libertarians would be inclined that way on principle. But uh, from the point of view of, of reaffirming old truths, it's a bit of a puzzle. And I wondered if you'd explain how you, uh, why you voted that way. <laughs> Just to give you some more background, there was an initiative in the state of Maryland, as there were in other states, a constitutional amendment which would legalize gay marriage, in effect. I started out with the gay marriage issue of saying, I'm willing to grant all sorts of uh, rights to gays who engage in contractual relationships. I have no problem with that, but marriage means something different and uh, with heterosexuals, and we can't give up that word. We can't give up that concept. I believe that very deeply. I still wish it were true. Over the years, two things have happened. Uh, one thing is that my wife and I have several friends, both lesbian and, and male homosexuals, who are in relationships like that, whether they are in states where they've been able to legally marry or not. And I gotta tell you that in every case, these relationships look like loving, long-term relationships that, that uh, make me feel queasy about not honoring, all right? But I still held, uh, still say marriage plays a unique role. Uh, then I look at what heterosexuals have done to marriage. And, um, and uh, it is true that in the upper middle class, marriage is still alive and well and very healthy. Uh, in the United States. But uh, for much of the rest of society, it is, it is largely collapsed. And it's, um, it's heterosexuals who have, who have treated marriage in a way that makes it, po well, let's put it this way. If heterosexual marriage has rem had remained as strong as it was 50 years ago, nobody would take gay marriage seriously because it would be so taken for granted that uh, heterosexual marriage with children is this central social institution. It isn't anymore. So it, 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 it already has lost a lot of the, of the cachet it had. So the combination of those two things uh, led me to, and by the way, I Twittered about this. So the way you heard about it was I tweeted. And the actual, th I didn't know that this amendment was on the ballot. That shows you how much attention I pay to contemporary politics. So I get there to the voting booth. There it is in front of me. And I'm not making this up. I sort of, sort of stared at it for about 45 seconds. And I said, oh, what the hell? And I said, yes. And that was, that was kind of the degree of, uh, of, of, I was saying that we have a situation now where the culture has changed in ways that make geezers like me uncomfortable, but it's time to move with the times and time to tell my gay friends who are actually doing everything right with regard to marriage that I will stop trying to get in their way. Uh, Dr. Murray, my name's Alan Anderson. Um, your zip code data was uh, very compelling and it certainly gels with my experience uh, in a number of countries, uh, not all of them uh, Western. And when I was reflecting on the cause behind this greater segregation, the first thing that sprang to mind was that maybe changing technological trends and economic models have facilitated that segregation between different classes. But reflecting on it a bit more, uh, and reflecting on the concept that perhaps people want to belong, uh, to have a sense of identity, which uh, is not universal, but is actually you know, membership of exclusive groups. I was wondering if you think that to some extent uh, that the erosion of the strength of national identities uh, or even, uh, and I say this as an atheist, uh, even religious identities, has contributed to this situation where, uh, you know, the uh, editor of a newspaper in Australia perhaps feels stronger kinship with the, uh, you know, the bureau desk of CNN in Beijing uh, than with, with his own countrymen in the working class. Let me just comment briefly on the role of technological change in the segregation. An interesting thing that I would like people in this audience to take into consideration is that actually technological change has made it easier to do what I did and my family did. We moved out of Washington, D.C. to a town of 172 people in rural Maryland. Well, 50 years ago, uh, we would have been pretty isolated out there. Now with the internet, 
I have the whole world in my, in my home office where I work, uh, and I can sort of have the best of everything. I can have interaction with, with the intellectual worlds that I enjoy. I can get into DC with my automobile in an hour and half an hour and a half, and, but I can also live in a very different kind of town where I get a lot of the satisfactions that I tried to describe during my presentation. In many ways, technological change has made it easier for all of us to broaden the range of places that we can live and do our work uh, and choose what, where we want to go. Uh, the, the second aspect of your remarks about feeling more kinship with people of our own group who live in other countries is very telling. And I think that has been true for a long time in Europe. I think that French intellectuals have never uh, had a warm and fuzzy place in their heart for French peasants. And they've, they've always been more comfortable with, uh, they've always been more comfortable in terms of their intellectual relationships with, with other uh, intellectuals around Europe. And that has, that has increased. That didn't used to be true in the United States. I don't think it used to be true in Australia as well. That there was a very strong sense of being an American. And a very strong sense when you were asked what class you were in, that the right answer is, I'm in the middle class. And you said that even if you were, objectively in the lower class and objectively in the upper class. You wanted to be part of the middle class. And you were really worried about doing things that separated yourself. Uh, and th how is that diminished? Why is that diminished? In large part, it's diminished in the United States because we gave up on teaching the national iconic stories that bound us together. It used to be that if you grew up in the United States, you were propagandized with what it means to be an American. And you were propagandized very effectively. And that was true of immigrant kids as well. They would land in New York, the parents couldn't speak uh, English, but they wanted their kids to speak English. The kids go off to the public schools, and the public schools from day one are saying to the kids over and over, welcome to America, now here's what you gotta buy into. And we gave up doing that. If you give up doing that in the, in the educational system, the glue that makes you feel like you're an American and that special, that also goes away. And then the college sorting system also plays a big role. Um, if you, let's, let's say, and I'm sure this applies to a number of people in this room. Uh, if you have been a really smart kid in a small town or a city where you went to very, you know, widespread public schools, drawing, you had in many ways a hard time of it. You were around kids who didn't have the same interests as you did. You had to worry about using words that were too big or else you'd get teased. You had to worry about revealing what your interests were because some of your interests would get you teased. And in many ways, you led a very lonely life. On the other hand, in order to cope with that life, a lot of you ended up figuring out ways to cope which meant figuring out ways to get along with the people around you. And in the process, you, you began to appreciate the strengths and the good things and the attractive things about people who weren't like you. But the fact is, you were lonely, and if you had been given the chance, do you want to go to the school you're going to, or would you rather go to a school where everybody gets your jokes? You would have chosen the school where everybody gets your jokes, where everybody, other, the other kids are interested in the things you're interested in. You would have chosen that. And you would have had a happier school time experience, probably. You would have also grown up not able to deal with people that you learned how to deal with in the, in the, in the other kind of situation. And what we've done in the United States is more and more people are unable to grow up in a very exclusive kind of intellectual circle and guess what, they enjoy that circle and they don't feel any particular strong need to try to expand it. Charles, uh, John Green here. Thank you once again for a stunningly insightful lecture and for pointing out why America is not Australia. Because we drink beer, a lot of it. And our children drink even more of it. And I never thought, I'd see a social purpose in binge drinking. <laughs> but, my, but my question is really around your criticism of the new intellectual elite uh, as people who, to use your words, view capitalism as no more than a convenient way to make money 
and your welcome call that we return to a vocabulary of virtue, a really welcome call. But I wonder whether the old intellectual elite should be sharing some of the blame. Milton Friedman, who I know you admire and many of us in this room admire, is famous for many things, including saying, <coughs> only people have responsibilities, corporations do not, and the social purpose, the social responsibility of business is to work to increase its profits provided you play the game. To me, uh, as I listened to you tonight, I pondered that what he wrote back then sounds uncomfortably close to what you were saying that capitalism is merely a way of making money. And I wonder whether Milton Friedman could, or indeed should, have used more of a vocabulary of virtue. Thanks. Milton Friedman, uh, I'm really glad he isn't here because whatever I answer he would destroy in, a, in about 30 seconds. Uh, if any of you were ever around Milton, he's one that's wonderfully cheerful, upbeat, uh, there wasn't a mean-spirited bone in his body, but in debate he would just simply eviscerate you with a smile on his face. Um, and so I'm sure he wouldn't like my answer. Technically speaking, he is absolutely correct that the responsibility of a business is to, to make a profit. As we, in, in practice, as we are engaged in business, as people are engaged in business, they face a whole lot of decisions from day to day, which can go one way or the other, that are not so much in, will this increase or reduce our profits, but does this represent the way we want to do it? My father worked for 50 years for the Maytag Company, which no longer exists. The Maytag Company uh, made the, great, the greatest washing machines in the world, and they were known to be that. Uh, they were known to be utterly reliable and uh, great value for money and the highest levels of integrity and so forth. Well, my father was part of that business and he loved that aspect of it. What made working for the Maytag company uh, so fulfilling to him was that he was engaged in a moral enterprise. He would have never he would have never said that the decisions he made, he was the manager of market product planning, which meant that he was in charge of the liaison between sales and research. And research would come up with these really cool new gadgets, and sales would say, oh, those will be really sexy to, to sell. And my dad would say, yeah, but they won't make any clothes any cleaner, and the washing machine will just break down faster. And he'd say, don't do it. Uh, and, and, and that kind of ethos in the company, the company culture, made a huge difference to the nature of the earned success. And I'm hoping as I say this that those of you around the room who have your own businesses know exactly what I'm saying. It isn't that you don't want to maximize profits. You want to make those profits in a certain kind of way because the fact is you're very proud of what it is you do. Um, so I think Milton would say I'm still technically wrong that there is no moral responsibility to do anything but maximize profit. I think also Milton would be very sympathetic with the idea of excellence in business, in what you're selling, uh, whether it's a product or service, being a really important part of the expression of oneself as an individual. I hope that's responsive. Thank you. Can I join those? Thank you for your wonderful lecture. You have diagnosed the problem brilliantly. You use the word transcendent or transcendental value at some point. Um, am I not right in thinking that the two great awakenings, the Christian awakenings in the 18th and 19th centuries, created an energy in the American culture, whether you're a Christian believer or not, which gave the notion that life was accountable to something greater than yourself, and that this cultural force has been very powerful in America? In a world in which people think they themselves are all there is, in an atheistic coming world, how can we get virtue unless there's some sense of transcendence? Uh, I, I take it you have not opened the book, uh, right? Am I right in thinking you haven't seen the book? I've seen the book but not read it. But you haven't, you haven't read any of it? Not yet. Okay, it. in the last chapter, I used the American Great Awakenings as the model of what I think needs to be done. We're on the same page, brother. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and, but let me, add, let me add something else, because the question, the issue of religion, I think, is, is very important to this. I, I speak as a, uh, I think full disclosure in these cases is important. I'm an agnostic who is a wannabe believer. Um, and, and let me elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, we have never had, in the history of civilization, uh, advanced societies that are as secular as Europe's are now, as Australia is becoming, and as the United States is heading toward. It is a leap of faith to say that advanced societies can exist without a very strong core of religious belief. Okay, that's one statement. A second statement is that I think in this regard we have good news. Because I, I also think, I think that unless you see your life as having transcendent meaning, that ultimately you subscribe to what I call the Europe syndrome, which says we are a collection of chemicals, we activate at some point, we deactivate later, and the purpose of the life is to pass the intervening interval as pleasantly as possible. And the role of government is to help us pass the time as pleasantly as possible. And the, the alternative is to say that to live, uh, that the phrase, a life well lived, has more meaning than that. It doesn't have to be religious. There can be secular definitions of a life well lived that have transcendent quality, but I'll tell you what, it's a whole lot easier if there is an element of spirituality or religion associated with that. And that gives me an opening for my favorite analogy of where we stand with regard to all of this. Uh, I think that the 20th century will be seen in retrospect as the, as the adolescence of the human species. Over the course of the, of the uh, 18th and 19th century, we had first the Enlightenment, then we had Darwin, then we had Freud, then in the early 20th century we had Einstein, and each of those was a body blow to, uh, to religious belief as it had traditionally been uh, understood. And in the 20th century, intellectuals sort of treated all of this the way adolescents treat, treat it when they find out their parents have been wrong about something. They assume their parents have been wrong about everything. And they th throw the whole thing out. It is not that in the 20th century you had intellectuals who read Thomas Aquinas carefully and said, no, I think that guy's wrong. Uh, it's not that they, that they understood the nuances of Christian theology, or for that matter, Judaism, uh, and, and, and on a considered basis said that. Instead, they said, oh, the Sunday school stories we learned are obviously silly, and that's religion, and I don't believe it. The nice thing about adolescence is that kids grow out of it. And I think there are signs that in the 21st century you have a lot of people, maybe just because the baby boomers are approaching death and maybe they think it's time to get their act in order, but uh, aside from that, questions such as why is there something rather than nothing? And what does it mean to live a life well? Are things that human beings cannot avoid asking. And for the 20th century, we pretty much avoided asking those questions. And I think the good news is those questions, which are so hardwired into the human condition, are starting to come back, and that we will go back to religion, including what I think is the magnificent intellectual tradition of the uh, Christian religion, taking the theology out of it. And we will start to realize there is a great deal of human wisdom in all of that. And not only that, Religiosity does not consist of sitting on a stand dune uh, under the starlight waiting for God to open himself up to you. It involves a lot of hard work and, and study and thought. All of that, I think, is going to happen just because I think the 20th century was artificial. As I say, we were adolescents. The human species is now growing out of that, and that's wonderful. We've got three, but they're going to have to be very quick, please, Don and then Michael. And I'll give quicker answers. Yeah. Uh, Don Markwell from the Menzies Research Centre. Charles, in your superb lecture, you said that capitalism is, in the United States, under sustained attack from the population at large and from the current administration. Could you tell us more, please, about what you see as the signs of that sustained attack on capitalism and what you think are the reasons for that sustained attack? Well, I, I take the uh, evidence for the hostility to capitalism from the collected speeches of Barack Obama. Uh, there is no time that he ever talks about capitalism which, which embraces uh, the wonders of capitalism. 
He will refer to it as, oh yeah, that's, that's what's generated economic growth, and he'll segue from that immediately into, but fairness is what we have to worry about, and so forth. So quick answer is, uh, there, I've seen no sign in that administration that there is anybody in that administration who knows what it means when you go into a small store and there is a dollar bill framed above the cash register, which is the first dollar bill that the place earned. Nobody in the Obama administration knows why that's important. Michael. Uh, Charles, Michael Stutchbury from the Financial Review. Uh, I read the bell curve some time ago. Didn't quite buy the central thesis of intelligence and race as opposed to intelligence. That and was culture. not the central thesis of the bell curve, sir. <laughs> uh, and uh, reading, and I haven't read, um, I haven't read the, the new book uh, on virtue. Uh, I've, but just hearing tonight, I'm not sure if I, at first blush, buy the idea that uh, meritocracy, competition, and globalization is adding up to something that is sort of bad, and wonder if the alternative explanation, again, without reading the book, uh, is that globalization has increased the returns to stars, as they say, and that may be K Street lawyers or uh, people with great ideas like Steve Jobs or could be seven foot kids from the, from, the, from the ghettos of the American cities, or could be entertainers, as, rapid, as radically increase the returns to them in a globalized environment. Uh, and as well, uh, as at the same time, has put great pressure on the economic standing of the American middle class and lower middle class, in contrast to Australia, where globalization has actually enriched the middle class and lower class to the extent that you can go down to Woolworths and buy a bottle of champagne now for the, the price of three packets of, of cigarettes, which has never happened before in our history. If, it's, if, it's, if it is, though, a bad thing that we're getting the self-sustaining, uh, meritocratic but nonetheless, but self-sustaining uh, upper, upper class ruling class, is there a danger that this analysis would actually encourage policy responses, even though as a libertarian you say you're not a policy person, would it encourage policy responses such as perhaps an inheritance tax on the self-sustaining upper class to finance perhaps cuts on income tax from the lower classes? Is that a danger or is it something that you yourself through your analysis would actually welcome? Well, first place, globalization uh, doesn't play a role in the book. Um, and I don't, I, I think globalization is a good thing. And I think that a lot of the ways in which you described it as having uh, good effects in Australia, they've it's had similar good effects in the United States. So none of the trends I'm talking about do I ever argue that globalization caused. Your next point, though, would the kind of analysis I have, would that lend uh, arguments for 100% inheritance tax and things like that? Uh, no. Um, actually, if it, during the presentation, I hope I made clear, the problem isn't money here. The problem is cultural, so that you go to college towns where there's college faculty, none of whom are making more than $150,000 a year, let's say. There aren't any really rich people. You see exactly the same culture of the upper middle, of the new upper class that you see in much more wealthier neighborhoods. Getting rid of the money is not going to get rid of the cultural separation that currently exists. The whole, the whole focus on money as being the, na the nature of the divergence, I think misses the, the, misses the point. One more. One more, and it'll be a short one at Des. Uh, Des Moore, my, I'm a director of the Institute for Private Enterprise, which uh, might suggest something to you, and I agree with uh, a lot of what you said. I think you've overstated uh, quite badly the situation, the historic situation, the improvement of what you might call the lower classes or the bottom class. Uh, there's been an enormous improvement here in Australia and I think in other developed countries, including even the United States, in the incomes and culture of the lower classes. Uh, look at the number of degrees of university degrees alone, but not only that, on their income levels uh, as well. And so uh, I think you need to moderate your 
well-deserved criticisms of the problems we face now. Well, very quickly, um, there are some ways in which the lower class, the income poverty levels have gone down. There has been increased yeah, People in have moved up. Uh, and there has been social mobility yeah. fostered by precisely the kind of college sorting machine that I talked about where we have done, done a very good job of identifying uh, talent in the lower class and moving it up. What I'm saying is this, a working class community in 1960 was, it consisted of functioning communities in the United States that, that could handle their own problems. They were often very tight knit, uh, very effective at dealing with their own problems, had very high marriage rates, they had incredibly high labor force participation rates, they had uh, high religiosity rates, and they were pretty honest. And that on all four of the dimensions I just gave you in the United States, and this is a matter of empirical evidence, it's not a matter of opinion, all four of those have collapsed in the working class of the United States. All four of those have gotten worse. And so whatever the economic consequences and whatever the advantages of meritocracy, which get talented people out of those neighborhoods is, is concerned, the functioning of working class neighborhoods has gone through the floor, and that's problematic. I think you need to thank move. you, thank you very much. Uh, I th I've enjoyed this for a lot. Just hang on, Charles. Hang on. Uh, th thank you very much, Charles. Uh, I'm about to call on Peter Curdy, who's a research fellow at CIS, uh, to move a vote of thanks. But before he does, for those who are not members, Michael Darling mentioned it earlier on. On the table is a green form. I'd encourage you to fill it in. So thank you very much, and over to Peter. Back. Anti-libertarians will have us believe that capitalism and virtue are what chastity and continence were to St. Augustine. <laughs> Distant aspirations rather than binding obligations. Dr. Murray, tonight you have helped us to understand why capitalism and virtue are indeed uh, obligations that bind us and are binding upon us. And you have done that in, I think, in a very dramatic portrayal of this divergence of classes in the American society. I was very excited when Greg invited Dr. Murray to give the John Bonathan lecture this year. I just read Coming Apart and was privileged to review it for policy and felt that the arguments that were presented there were completely compelling, not in the sense that they were uh, without that they were beyond question, I think you yourself would not, uh, would not propose that, but that they were compelling in terms of the way in which they showed that virtue needed to underlie the way in which we, um, the way in which we choose to live and the decisions we make about how we are to live. So tonight you have reminded us of the importance of the exercise of self-restraint, of the recovery of virtue, and of a commitment to what you've called the civic catechism. Libertarians love to talk about freedom. We like to talk about freedom of economics, freedom of law, freedom of religion. But I think there is a moral responsibility to exercise liberty in a virtuous way. And you, I think, have recalled us to that important question, that question which underlies the investigation of virtue, which is how are we to live? What do we want freedom for? if we are not prepared to think how and to, work and to, and to exercise responsibility, responsibly the freedom that we say is so important. We want freedom, what will we do with it? The left, I think, has often successfully portrayed uh, free market thinkers, libertarians, as people who abdicate responsibility. We've seen that just through the American presidential election. I think the, those of us on what we might call the right, or the right of center, wherever, wherever we wish to position ourselves, have to articulate a new vision of capitalism and virtue that shows that, in fact, capitalism is no abdication of virtue, but rather models a form of integration of virtue. These are indeed old ideas whose time is ready to come again. Dr. Murray, thank you very much indeed for heralding their return and for showing us something of how we might make decisions about how we are to live. Dr. Murray, on behalf of us all at CIS, can I present you with this Australian garment? You will have more use for it, I think, in, in uh, your northern winter than you will at the moment here, but please accept this with our thanks and our very good wishes. Thank you. Thank you.